For those of you who are joining us online through Facebook Live, um, it's great to be with you. I know uh, Miss Mary Lou is in the hospital having had a broken femur and surgery, so we are praying for you, Mary Lou, and hopefully you can connect with us uh, through our online streaming. And then our buddy John, John uh, had knee surgery, is not here this week as well, and so it's great that we can connect uh, through the live stream. All right, we are week two in Hot Topics which is an annual sermon series that is completely audience-driven. So I'm taking your entries and preaching on them, and I'm excited about this morning. Uh, This is one that I've gotten a couple years in a row and I've never done because it's a little obscure, but it seemed like a great opportunity. It's the story of Elisha and the Bears. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Elisha and the Bears. Okay, just a handful of you. All right, awesome. So I'm going to read you the passage, and then we are going to talk about why we're going to do it, and then we're going to get to work. All right. So I'm going to read the, old, the King James Version. Anybody King James readers? All right. The King James reader is the most troubling, so I figured we'll read that one. You guys ready for this? Woo! Second Kings, chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. And he, speaking of the prophet Elisha, and he went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. And he went thence to Mount Carmel. And from thence he returned to Samaria. The end. Isn't that a great story? You guys are like, what did I get myself into today? If you're here for the first time, you're like, what kind of church is this? So I decided to preach this because somebody, again, this year asked for it. I've had several people ask between sermon series, what is going on in this passage? And um, I want to talk about it because it is stereotypical of some of those odd passages in the Old Testament that if you're a person that reads your Bible every day and is trying to read the whole thing before you die, you come across these stories and you kind of should read them and go, what in the world is that all about? Anybody have that experience? So the prophet of God proclaims a curse because some kids insulted him and some bears came out of the wood and tore up the children. Go and be filled. You know, like, let's pray and have some ministry time for that. What is going on? Um, Another thing you'll find is if you do some research on this, it is the fodder for all criticism of Christianity. You know this? Um, If you type in this passage into your Google search engine, mostly what will come up is atheistic websites ridiculing the scriptures, pointing out things like this that put God as as kind of some arbitrary, vindictive, and violent character who permits all sorts of atrocities in his name. And so it's justification for people who are skeptics to totally disregard the scriptures and the God of the scriptures. Um, If you're like me, I'm kind of a skeptic by nature, even though I'm a man of faith and a, a disciple of Jesus. And so when I get to a text like this, I want answers. So if you're here this morning and you want answers, well, you're in for a shocker. Because I'm going to give you answers. We're going to talk about how do we understand this passage and then does it have any relevance for your life today? And I'm going to tell you that actually it does. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I've done significant text work just from the three verses in this chapter in this book and the, a bunch of stuff, way more stuff than I could ever fit into one sermon. And since my sermons have been running over and causing a parking lot jam, I uh, decided to limit myself by time. And so I'm going, to do, I'm going to open and close with the two points that I want to make. And then I've basically got notes on pretty much anything else any of you could ask. So I'm going to read the passage in the ESV, and then I'm going to ask you to interact with me a little bit. So if there's component parts of this passage that you notice, that you go, I wonder what that means, I'm going to ask you to shout them out. Are you guys comfortable talking back to me in church? Can, can somebody say, all right, all right. Way to go, 930. You guys are energetic. All right, let's do this thing. So here it is in the ESV. This is the one we normally preach from. You can skip the message translation one that I had up there as well. Maybe do that in the second service. Just keep it fresh. All right. So here's the ESV. Elisha went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him saying, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. And from there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Now, in order for us to understand that or any passage of Scripture, there should be a lot of things that stand out to you. And the very first move you should have is never to read a passage like that in entire isolation. Because you will never figure out what it means when you don't look to see where it is. And so what I want to do is back up to verse 1 of chapter 2, 
and just read the story that it's a part of because it's part of a, a whole unit. And you'll see something that happens and it'll start to give us an insight into the passage. Now, starting in verse one, it says, now when the Lord, so we're getting a setting, now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And I'll tell you who each of those guys are in a few minutes. And Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you not know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep it quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep it quiet. Shuddy. And then verse 6. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them. And as they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and the two of them could go over on dry ground. And when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two pieces and he took up the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other and Elisha went over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, behold, now there are your servants, 50 strong men. Please let them go up and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and for three days sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Now the men of the city said to Elisha, behold, the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. And they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. You guys still want to laugh, I can tell. I've been reading for like five minutes. You're like, oh, he's a bald head again. (laughs) And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord, and the two she-bears came out of the woods, tore the 42 boys, and from there he went on to Mount Carmel and returned to Samaria. Okay, so what's going on in this passage? Um, here's the most important thing you have to understand whenever you read some obscure and unusual text. Sorry for those of you who fell asleep, you can wake them up. Um, uh, whenever you read something that has a question, you go, this appears to be violent and unlike the nature of God, and I don't understand what's going on here. It's really important that you understand that this Bible is um, a work of 66 different books written over about 1,600 years by over 40 authors, and yet it's inspired by God and has a cohesive message from front to back. It has happened in history in real time. It's been preserved for us, and it's reliable. And so when we get into this, we're entering into a story already in progress. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about the story. Can somebody say the story? The story. Brothers and sisters, you are part of the story. The story is playing out. And the story of the Bible, which takes us through to today, is a story of God's salvation through judgment. All of it is about God's 
salvation through judgment. Adam and Eve, God created them. He made them for a relationship. He created them in love. He put them in a perfect place. He dwelled with them as their God and he was their people. But he created them in his image with the power to think and feel and believe and love and trust and obey. And he gave them an option to obey him and love him and know him forever or not. And they chose not. And so judgment begins. And from the story of Adam and Eve on to Noah and his salvation uh, through the flood to the Tower of Babel and to God's promise with the Iraqi sun worshiper Abraham and all of God's many promises, the whole, all the stories of the Bible are the stories of God's salvation through judgment. There's always judgment coming because of wrongdoing and everyone would be judged and destroyed except that God in his mercy and his love and his grace is going to save people. This is the good news of the Bible. Bible, ultimately the reason all of us are here, and so every story you read will be a story about salvation through judgment. Can I get amen? amen? If you know Jesus, if you know the Lord God, and you know this is how those scriptures work, I need you to say amen. So the people who don't know that go, oh, they must be right. <laughs> this is a story of salvation through judgment. And so what we should expect to see in all the stories is two things, salvation and judgment. Pretty simple, right? And so it's a story. There's a story there. There's also a history. It's not just that this is some mythological thing God is doing that has some analogy in life and it's fruitful and helpful for us spiritual people to try to get our minds to tweened into some kind of uh, helpful ways of thinking and acting. It's actual history. And so how many of you guys love history? You love the History Channel, you love Netflix documentaries, and then there's everyone else, right? And so history is not for everybody. But when we read the scriptures, you don't have to love history, but you have to know that this actually happened. This is recorded and actually happened. And you could have doubts about whether it happened. But I don't know why anybody would put a story about the prophet of God bringing bears out of the children. What is the motive for adding that to the book? And so this is the story of what happened, and it's a history. And here's the thing. All of this history and all of this salvation through judgment comes to us in the form of God's interaction with mankind in terms of blessings and curses. And so we see a curse on the ground. We see a curse on man's toil. We see a curse in childbirth. We see a curse happen at the fall. We see the curse of the flood. We see the curse in the law for those who disobey it. It's blessings and curses. Promise of blessing, threat of curse. Promise of blessing, threat of curse. And whatever, every single time, everybody goes after the promise of blessing, disbelieves God, ends up experiencing the curse and have to be saved through the judgment of the curse. And here's the good news. This story has gone somewhere and we exist in the best part of the story. You know why? Because Galatians 3, 13 and 14 tells us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Here's the good news, everybody. There's no more blessings and curses, blessings and curses. God has dissolved all curses in the person of his son Jesus. And on the cross, he has obliterated curses so that you by faith might be in the Messiah and therefore walk in the blessing. So you don't have to worry about bears coming out to tear you to pieces. You don't have to worry about proclaiming curses because the curses are over. But we should expect to see in the history the blessings and the curses, the salvation and the judgment. Now, let's talk about the characters. Who in this story did you notice? This is where you talk. Elijah. Elijah. Who else? Elisha. Elisha. Who else? Bears. All right. The Lord. Yep. The children. The little children. Uh, let's talk about some of those, those people. Elijah, with the J, is a prophet raised up by God during the period of the kings. And so if you read through the history... You've got the creation, the Pentateuch, the five books of the law. You've got God's people ending up in Egypt, saved through famine by Joseph. And then they end up as slaves 400 years later, delivered by Moses, wandering in the wilderness, and then led by Joshua into conquest of the promised land. You guys know the story, if you're familiar with the Bible, but those are the stories. And so eventually, there's, we just went through the series on judges. There was a whole period where there was no king. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. It was a terrible time in Israel's history. And then God anoints a king. The people want a king, God makes a king, so we have Saul, David, Solomon, a united Israel under three kings, and then if you know the history, you know that after Solomon's death, 
There is a lot of strife about who should be king next, and the kingdom is divided in sort of a civil war tension, and you have these tellings of these kings in the north and these tellings of these kings in the tribe in the south. And so Elijah is a prophet who's speaking God's word of judgment and salvation to his people during this reign of the kings. That's the history, and you guys are bored already. Okay. Elijah does miracles. He cleanses lepers, he multiplies food, and he raises the dead. And so you read those miracles, and what do we see? We see a picture of God's salvation breaking into his judgment, despite the fact that people are doing evil things. Those are signs of the healing that God wants to bring to the whole world. They're they're kind of a, a signpost of guess what's coming. And so Elijah can't live forever, but Elijah doesn't die. He's one of two people in the Bible who is taken up into heaven, Enoch and Elijah. And what we just read was the story of Elijah being taken up into heaven. He knows it's the day. In fact, everybody knows it's the day. Hey, do you know this is Elijah's take-up day? Yes, I know that. Please be quiet. Hey, do you know Elijah's? Everybody's like the worst kept secret ever. Uh, what? And Elijah says, stay away, stay away, stay away. Just, just stay away. He's trying to like depart in peace. He's like an old cat looking for a place to go die in the woods, right? No, 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 just leave me alone. I'm disappearing. And so this is what Elijah's doing. Now, the reason this passage matters is because in this passage, what we're seeing is the role of lead prophet in Israel falling from Elijah to Elisha. Do you guys see that clearly in the passage? He asked for a double portion of his spirit. His cloak or his coat or his mantle literally fell to the ground. Elisha picks it up, touches the water just like his master had. Oh, the seas part. He walks through it. This whole chapter is about Elisha is now the man. Somebody say, Elisha is the man. man. Not everybody thinks Elisha is the man, do they? Even the guys that saw it happen and see him wearing Elijah's coat and see that he's crossed the sea, all those 50 prophets in Jericho, they're like, hey, he's got the spirit of Elijah, right? And then they're like, maybe we should go look for Elijah. No, you don't need to do that. He's gone. Well, we think maybe he's on a mountain or in a valley. We're going we're gonna to go look. Can we go look? You're the boss, but we're going to go look for the big boss. So you see some reluctant response to the new guy, the new boss man, the new prophet of God? Yes. Now, has anybody ever been in a job where you got promoted to being your boss's boss, or you got promoted up, and everybody that you used to work with now works for you? You know that tension? Okay, that's the tension that Elisha's experiencing. And so he does two things in this passage. He does a miracle of blessing, performs a miracle of cursing. One, salvation the lifting of a curse, and the other, the proclamation of a curse that results in God moving to bring judgment. And this is why you can't divorce the story of Elisha and the bears from what happens at Jericho with the healing of the spring. And so we're going from Elijah to Elisha, and so the power of Elisha being appointed and anointed by God is, is why this whole passage is happening in the first place. Did you guys notice any of those place names? Anybody ever been to Bethel? Mount Carmel? Jericho, east of the Jordan. Some of you guys have done the Israel tours. Have you ever moved to a new city and people are talking about stuff? You have no idea where it is. People are new to Port Orange. and Oh, go to the pavilion. What is that? Where do I find that place? And we don't have to think about it anymore because we can Google everything. But it's really helpful if you understand the geography of the ancient Near East to understand what's going on. Um, in fact, it's really purposeful what's going on because what's happening here is that Elijah is taking Elisha to the place where you hand off power, the east of the Jordan. You know what happened east of the Jordan generations before? Moses, the deliverer of God's people and the man of God, passed off leadership of God's people to Joshua, the son of Nun. And what happened? Joshua walked out into the Jordan with the staff put the staff in the water, and much to everyone's surprise, the water parted for Joshua. And everybody said, oh, Joshua's the man. And so what does Elijah do? He goes, get away from me. I'm going to the place where I pass off the power. I'm not leaving. I'm going with you, right? And so it's a very strategic movement. And then what happens when that happens out there between Elijah and Elisha is Elijah says, hey, that's, that's a hard thing. You want double portion of my spirit. That's a hard thing. I can't just say yes to that. And so you're going to have to leave that in God's hands. He wants you to see it. You'll see it. He wants you to get it. You'll get it. And when it's God's choice that Elisha's the prophet, then we see him move the exact same way that Joshua did when he brought conquest to the land. Went from east to the Jericho, crossed the river, went to Bethel, went to Mount Carmel. You see that? And that's purposeful. It's not arbitrary. You're like, oh, Elisha's taking a journey and had some children killed the end. 
No, it's, a, it's powerful. The second thing we notice about these places is that he heals a curse in Jericho. There's these prophets there, 50 prophets. Elisha's the new boss man prophet, and he says, um, they say, hey, listen, this is a great place to be. It's a great place to live, but the water's terrible, and so the land's all dead. And there had been a curse on Jericho. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but when Joshua, you know Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, anybody grow up singing the songs? Marched around it one time a day for six days on the seventh day, went around seven times, then blow trumpets and shout, and the whole walls came tumbling down. And the walls came tumbling, tumbling. Right? Anybody? Nothing? Yeah. And after that happened, though, Joshua pronounces a curse on Jericho. Maybe you didn't read that part uh, in your Bible. The curse is Joshua 6. 26 and 27, the, the, it says Joshua laid an oath on them at that time saying, cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. And when Ahab was king, first King 16, there was a guy that decided to rebuild Jericho. You know what happened? When he finished the foundation, his firstborn died. And when he finished the city and installed the gates, his youngest son died. And from that point forward, the water was bad. And so Elisha does his first miracle to cleanse the water at Jericho and to bring blessing and salvation through judgment. You see that picture? So we have a blessing, we have some salvation, but we also have people rejecting God. And so we get these little boys. Somebody said little boys. Did you guys notice in one translation it said little children? The other translation said some boys. Whenever you get into the scriptures and it says something you don't understand, it's really important to understand what those words are, why they get translated the way that they do. So let's talk about that a little bit. In the Hebrew, the little children phrase is katan neher. Can you guys say that? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to say that. <laughs> katan neher, and it means little children. Now, you may find somebody preach on this at some point. If any of you have ever heard a sermon on this passage, which I think you probably haven't, because uh, there's a strong impulse to not talk about these things, and they don't preach super well, as you guys can tell. Right? So, Katan Neher. Some people will say, well, it could mean young men. It's flexible. It actually is flexible. And there's another word used where it says children. It's an entirely different word later on in the same set of verses. Uh, yaled, which is a different verb for young men. No, they age these kids. Does it make you feel better if these are like teenage thugs? Okay? So, imagine a gang of thugs with, that have come out basically are trying to run off Elisha. We don't want you here. Or insulting him and trying to get him to leave. And when they say go up, they're talking about go up the way your master just did. Go to heaven, right? We don't want you here. We're rejecting you. And so if you imagine them as being 18 to 25-year-old punks who want to start a fight and there's 100 of them, 50 of them, you might start to think, oh, that's a little different. It's a little hard to read little children. You think a bunch of little six-year-olds are like, hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy, ah! You know, like, (laughs) that's kind of terrifying. And, And you wonder... 42 of them. Like, what's the number, why is the number 42 in there? I, I put myself in that situation. If I'm, if I'm an 18, 25-year-old thug and I see some she-bears tearing up my homies, uh, I'm not sticking around to be number 41, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm out. I mean, there's two bears and a bunch of those. I'm just gone. And so what's going on? Are we seeing helpless little children being mauled to pieces? Or are we seeing these guys fighting bears? We're not told. The text doesn't tell us. All we have are those words. What do we do with those words? We have some options. You know, uh, it's actually an insult to say um, Katan Nehar. Did you know that? You can use it as an insult or as hyperbole. In 1 Kings 3, 7, when Solomon becomes king, he says in verse 7, And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a Katan Nehar. He was a grown man, wisest man on the planet, powerful, respected, and he calls himself Katan Nahar. I'm a little kid. No idea what I'm doing. I'm in over my head. It's a euphemism. It's a way of talking. And so it could have been an insult. The author of Kings could have said, yeah, these guys came out little kids to what was about to happen. Maybe that's the option. Maybe, it's, maybe they were 18, 25. Who knows? It uh, it's, could be flexible. It could be teen thugs. Um, but here's the thing, and it's important that you recognize this. Um, you, when you think of little children, you think that's not fair or right, don't you? Is that the sentiment you have? If it's yes, say yes, if you're still paying attention. If you think bears killing little children because of the prophet's curse in the name of the Lord seems unjust, raise your hand. Okay, part of being a 21st century American Christian is we are intensely individualistic and intensely equitable. We want, we want liberty and justice for all, and we think everybody deserves a fair shake. 
And sometimes we don't recognize the fact that some people's errors and mistakes and sins drastically affect the people coming up behind them. Do you know that? It's not fair for babies to be born with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's not fair for kids to grow up in a broken home. It's not fair when bad things happen to innocent people because of the evil things the people before them. Can I get an amen? amen. And so we, we impose this on God as though he has to keep everything fair. We look around the world and we go, life is not fair. Life sucks. Sometimes it sucks more for certain people who are vulnerable in bad situations. And so even if these are little kids, they come out and they're just, they're just coming from a culture that says, we, we reject God. We, we want to go after the Baals. Bethel was a place where a golden calf had been set up because the evil king of the north didn't want his people going into the southern kingdom to worship. And he said, you know what? Forget Jerusalem. Bethel's the place. It's idol worship, and we're just going to reject the God of Israel. And here you have a little generation of who knows how old these kids coming out insulting God's prophet. And so when you understand what these words mean, and you understand the, the topics, and I can't even get into barrenness and the miscarriage of the land and all these other elements that are in there because you would all be asleep. We could just have nap day. Everybody, I'm going to talk about things you're not interested in and you get comfortable, right? Um, and so we could go on and on and on. But we don't have time, so we're going to stop. Um, what else? Somebody shout out to me some piece that stuck out to you. Oh, you're all done. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll just wrap it up then. Let me just say this. Uh, the number 42 is not arbitrary. The author of 2 Kings didn't go out and go, okay, one dead kid, two dead kids. In the scriptures, 42 is a sign of judgment. Do you know that? How many months does God release the, the beast and the false prophet to reign in Revelation? 42 months. This is the easy one. I just told you it was 42, right? <laughs> how, many, how many generations in the Old Testament kings lead to there being no firstborn to take out 42, three sets of 14? And so you see, curse, curse, judgment, judgment, 42, 42. In Daniel, 42 months. The drought that Elijah brings on in just, just chapters before. Guess how many months the drought was? All right. Wow, you guys are doing good. I should have stickers. Everybody should get a sticker today, right? 42. It's a sign of judgment. And so what we see is curse, judgment, salvation through judgment. And so we're getting the affirmation that Elisha is God's man. Those who reject God experience the curse of judgment, and that power rests in Elisha. That's the meaning of the text. Now, how in the world is that supposed to help you tomorrow? Because you're like, I got up and came to church today, and the waves were good, and all we did was talk about 42 and bears killing children, and how to read the Bible. Now, here's two things I want to leave you with. And here they are. One is, uh, we live in a world where uh, we're just under, under attack. People think that Christianity is silly. It's becoming less and less real to people. It's more criticized. You're going to interact with people who are going to point out this in passages like this. And if you don't have an answer for them, if you don't have a way to read your Bible that you can say to them, actually, there's some really profound and deep meaning in those verses. You want to take a minute and go over them? Uh, people will say, there's all kinds of errors in the Bible. I always say, name one. Just tell me one and we can talk about it. And so we want you to be able to engage with people who are reading the Bible and going, this is crazy, this is ridiculous, and then go, actually, can I tell you something amazing about God? Because this is a story of salvation through judgment. And sometimes bad things happen, but the good news is that God is moving to save people out of the bad things, and he wants to save you out of bad things that are coming for you too. And I can give you the good news of God's salvation. There's a promise. Okay, so you need that. And then secondly, you want to be able to read the Bible and get something from it every single day. And if you read 2 Kings 2, 23 or 25, and you're time, and you go, what is going on here? Here's, here's where it can lift your spirit. Check this out. What's happening here is both of a prophetic element, fulfillment, and foreshadowing. God brings Moses. Moses is going to die because Moses isn't God's eternal king and savior and deliverer, is he? He passes the reins to Joshua. Joshua leads a conquest into the land. Things deteriorate. Now, didn't work out so well with the leader. So God raises up Elijah, the mighty prophet, who does these foretastes of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. You know what there's going to be in the kingdom of heaven? No leprosy, no sickness, no, no, uh, no dirtiness, no uncleanliness. You're going to be instant access to God, completely healed 100% of the time. And so he does this miracle. There's not going to be any want, no famine, no hunger. And so he feeds miraculously and makes a picture of his provision in his miracles. And then what does he do? He raises the dead. We're going to a place where there's no more death, where there's only life. Life reigns. There's enough for everybody and nobody's sick. That's what God's about. He's putting together and Elisha does that. And then Elisha takes that double portion and doubles every one of those things. Do you know that? He says, I want the double portion, and I'm going to do 
Not 14 miracles like Elijah. I'm doing 28 miracles, even one when he was dead. That's another sermon. Right? So we get Moses, Joshua. We go out to the same geography. Now we do Elijah, Elisha. And you know what? We have a forecast prophecy about another man that would come with the spirit of Elijah who is going to prepare the way for the Lord himself. And so we're expecting another pair of leaders, this time to do something that's never been done before. And where does John the Baptist, who is in the spirit of Elijah, show up and start baptizing people? East of the Jordan. Right? And what does he do? He wears crazy clothes and he eats crazy stuff and he acts crazy in the desert. Why does he do that? Because Elijah did those things. And he's making a connection to a new Elijah. That means we have a new Elisha with double the spirit. In fact, Jesus is more than double every one of those two things. He blows everybody's minds and he shows the kingdom of heaven is completely free of disease, completely free of hunger, and has all life for every single person. And then he dies and takes all the curse that's left for anyone and bears it in his own body so that in him we might be completely free from the curse to walk in the blessing. What's powerful in this passage is not that it's the same, it's that it's different. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, not let the little bears come to the children. He didn't call out Winnie and Yogi and all their sharp claws to eat up the children. No. He made a way where there was no way. He he took the curse on himself. He allowed himself to be torn so that in him we might have life. Do you see that? Do you see a powerful prophet but who's God himself, has no limitation. John 3 says that he had the fullness of the spirit. Now here's the last thing. Check this out. This is gonna blow your mind. There's another slight little paradox here, and that is this. Think about a powerful prophet, does miracles, who ascends into heaven, whose body cannot be found for three days, who gives a double portion of his spirit to his followers and then commissions them to carry on his good work. See, you're in this passage too. Because it's not just about John the Baptist and Jesus. This is about Jesus and the disciples of Jesus. A cloak fell from heaven on the day of Pentecost, and power clothed over every one of God's people. Brothers and sisters, you have a part to play in this ongoing history of God bringing salvation through judgment. Listen, you're gonna turn your TVs on in the morning and you're gonna see judgment. You're gonna see calamity, natural disaster, hurricanes destroying stuff. You're gonna see war. You're gonna see all kinds of bad things happening to people. But brothers and sisters, we are not the explainers of judgment. We are the proclaimers of salvation. Can I get an amen? Every single one of us filled with an innumerable fullness of the spirit of God. And if we will choose to put that cloak on and walk in it, what will happen is that lives will be changed everywhere we go. We are the people who are supposed to carry the good news of what God is doing now so that people might escape coming judgment and experience God's salvation so that their curses might be lifted and they can walk in the blessing that God has provided for them in the name of his son Jesus. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to say goodbye to every curse? I'm talking real curses. I'm talking about curses of childhood abuse. I'm talking about curses of alcoholism. I'm talking about curses of addiction. I'm talking about the curses that are on people's lives right now, and Jesus made a way to take them away forever and to replace them with blessing. Are you ready to walk in the blessing of freedom? Are you ready to walk in the blessing of love? Are you ready to walk in committed marriages that make it? Why? Because you're great? No, because you're filled with the Spirit of God. Are you ready? Listen, I need more than bears killing children. I need more than a crazy dude with a heavy coat that can do twice as many cool things as the last dude. I need to wake up tomorrow and know that the power of God is in my heart, in my mind, in my mouth, and that I'm his. And that I exist to go the places he tells me, to say the things he tells me to say, to do the things he tells me to do, and I have every expectation that I will have them. Here's my last verse. John 14, 12 to 14. Talk about a great exchange happening. Jesus goes into the Jordan, comes out. Holy Spirit comes down. Jesus goes into heaven. Holy Spirit comes down. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever, whoever, that includes you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I'd like us to have much greater expectations this week 
as we head out into the world. Because it's not our job to proclaim curses. It's our job to proclaim salvation and blessing and then watch God answer our prayers. And so pray for people. Pray for your skeptic friends. Pray for your people that are going through hard things. Ask God for specific things. He's saying, I want to do crazy stuff for you. Do you believe that? If, you, if you're here and you believe that, tell me amen. amen. Thank you. And if you don't believe that, try it. You see what Elisha did? He, put that, he grabbed that coat. He didn't know if he was getting that double portion or not. He saw, he grabbed that thing. What did he do with it? No one's around. He out of the Jordan. Stick it in the water. <laughs> Woo! Right? They say, hey, the water's bad here. You're the prophet. Uh, give me some salt. What does salt do to water but ruin it, right? Now it's good forever. It is. You see, it's time for us to step out. Take that first step. If you trust God enough, this week I want you to pray for something crazy. Step out to do something crazy. Watch what he does. And then you tell me because I want to know, okay? Can I get amen? Amen. All right, I want to pray for you. Um, And I want to pray for one thing for all of us. If you're here and you don't know Jesus at all, you are missing the component of real life, real spiritual life, and that is the presence of God with you. That comes through faith in Jesus as you turn to him in repentance, receive his forgiveness, curses get lifted, blessing comes in, and then God moves in by the Holy Spirit. And so if that's you, today can be your day to say, all right, God, I want in on this big story. I want to be on the right side of history. And so I'm turning to you in repentance and faith. That can be your choice today, in any day, but today is the day. And if you're here and you have made that decision, it's very likely that you are walking around not experiencing the power that is available to you the fullness of the spirit that's been provided through, through faith in Jesus. And so if you have an expectant heart, I want you to make this your prayer that I want that spirit of God. I want that cloak. I want, to, I want to walk in the power of prayer. I want to have great expectations for what God can and will do through me. And I want to step out into faith to do things to watch him work. And so that's what I want to pray for all of us. And that's what I expect will be the things that will start to change our communities as we impact the people that are closest to us. Amen? Father, for and on behalf of everyone present in the room, following online, right now in this moment, God, we are hungry for your spirit. And we don't want just double what somebody else has. We want all that you have for us. God, we believe that the greatest prophet, priest, and king has come, has done what no human could do and had ever done, and that is to take away all curse by bearing it in his own body. God, your son Jesus died and for three days was in a tomb only to go missing because he has ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of God. And he has sent forth your Holy Spirit into the world, not to hover mysteriously, but to dwell intimately in the hearts of believers. And Lord, we are here this morning to say, we want that Holy Spirit in its entirety. We know that you're there, but we want to walk in the power. And so I pray, God, that you would remove every doubt that holds us back, that you would speak to us and lead us in the prayers we ought to pray, the things we ought to ask for, into the situations where there is need. Lord, we want to be people eradicating curses everywhere we go with the truth of Jesus and the power of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we are hungry. And so on behalf of everyone who has made that their prayer, we say, fill us, God, with your Spirit. Lead us in the way we ought to go. Give us the words to speak. Stir us when it's time to act. Lord, we are dependent. This is not some trick, and this is not anything we can do on our own. It is by the power of God alone. But we have faith in your word. And so, God, we just pray that you would do this thing for us right now so that today and tomorrow and Tuesday and the week to come and the years to come, we would be the people who are walking in the power of the Spirit of God and that we would see life change and blessings replace curses in the lives of the people we know and love and care for. We receive it from your hand with great faith and expectation. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.